welcome to the SciTech Summit. I'm so privileged today uh, to be speaking with such a, a thought leader, someone who I now consider a friend, uh, Mr. Steve D'Angelo. Thank you for joining us today at SciTech. Wonderful to be with you here at SciTech talking about one of my favorite subjects. Right, let's talk visionary plants. So give us one minute on your vision for a world including psychedelic therapies well you know my vision for a world is is broader than a world with just psychedelic therapies i i think that psychedelics can play a, a great many different roles in our lives and we we are just in the beginning processes the beginning stages of a process of a discovering um all of the roles that the, that psychedelics can play certainly uh, i think that that therapeutic psychedelics are going to revolutionize mental health care and hopefully will lead to the replacement of this whole variety of extremely, extremely toxic uh, antipsychotic medications that are, that are used um, that really devastate people's lives in many cases as much or more than the underlying mental conditions. And as a longtime activist and a visionary change maker, what lessons can we learn uh, from your experience to build an ethical psychedelics community? So um, most of my lessons come from the cannabis industry. And, you know, I guess the main lesson that I take away is that it's taken us a lot longer and it's been a lot more difficult than we thought when we started this movement 50 some odd years ago. Uh, and we've discovered that it really takes a variety of different approaches to, to be successful. Uh, there are, are is not one tactic, there's not one philosophy, there's not one organization uh, that's going to be able to make a change that's this big. Uh, so it's really important that we um, open ourselves to a variety of different approaches that we have an open mind about who our allies are going to be and then we think carefully about the fundamentals that are going to unite us um, what populations are we trying to serve what are the ultimate goals that we're trying to achieve and and then let our ethical principles flow out of that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the north star pledge but I think it's a it's a great starting point to think about ethics in the psychedelic community. And I guess my, my approach is sort of coming from someone who's come from the outside. So I'm a chemist on one hand, a pharmacist. I've been a cannabis entrepreneur. I believe heavily in the visionary plant space. I think we got it wrong from a chemical treatment perspective in what we've done in pharmacy and 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 chemistry for the last 50 years and we need to make a fundamental change but sitting on the sidelines of that um i see a, a evolution in the psychedelic ecosystem before us we have players who let's call them legacy uh activism researchers um people who've, who who come from a deep point of connection to whether it's the molecule or a plant or an organic material and how it can help someone and that they've chosen to put their life into that um and then you've got the new industry coming in which has you know the nuance of how do we make money from psychedelics how do we explode this into the consciousness of people um and how do we take all of that and create an ecosystem and a dialogue between the legacy and the new players that is fruitful and in the, it doesn't lead to the infighting uh, that really doesn't need to exist in this space because it's so very, very big and the impact can be so immense for mankind that we should really focus more on the ecosystem. Well, we could all start by approaching the situation with an appropriate sense of humility and solemnity. And I think that that sense of humility you know, just naturally flows from understanding the historical context of what we are up to here. We are talking about uh, making an epical change in human thought and human behavior. You know, for most of human existence, for millennia upon millennia upon millennia, 
human beings used visionary plants to break out of what Michael Pollan has called the default mode network, or that place where we spend most of our minds, most of the time, just thinking about the executive decisions we need to get through the day. And, and, and over the millennia, many, many cultures, many different spiritual and religious systems have used these visionary substances and plants to sort of double check what we're, what's going on in our regular ordinary world and make sure that it's in alignment with the deepest urges of our heart, with the deepest yearnings of our spirit. Unfortunately, and mostly in the Western world, but really, you know, throughout the industrialized world over the course of the last couple millennia, we've seen visionary plants and substances fall into disfavor, be banned, be made illegal, in many cases, be made extremely, extremely illegal. And so we are in the process of undoing 2000 years of very, very complex history. Um, and again, I go back to, to, to what I started with, right? No one approach is going to work. So uh, I think that, that we need to understand that there are going to be people who are going to approach cannabis from a, or are going to approach, excuse me, I'm so used to cannabis. Uh, people are going to approach psychedelics through a, a therapeutic lens. And that's, that's a, a totally valid lens. And, and we know that psychedelics can work in that fashion. There's also going to be people who approach uh, psychedelics as a sacrament, as a spiritual tool, and that's an equally valid approach. Um, uh, there are existing indigenous cultures in the world that already have very, very well-defined traditions uh, around psychedelics that have existed literally for thousands of years. All of these different paths are going to need to honor and respect each other as we move forward. We, we don't know what we're doing. We're, we're just returning to these substances. We're like little infants who are just beginning to discover the world. And so let's be gentle with each other and, and let's welcome a variety of approaches and let's understand that none of us all hold the answer ourselves. I, I couldn't agree more. And I guess that's one of the reasons I founded SciTech was that we can have an open dialogue, that we have a place to have that open dialogue. Um, my ultimate goal is that the industry as a whole adopts something that doesn't hurt itself in the long run. I think a lot of the ecosystem that was built around cannabis was detrimental to the ultimate, uh, ultimate outcome of cannabis and that we can prevent that from happening in the psychedelic movement um, by, by learning from the people who've come before us and standing on the the shoulders of those giants. Um, Steve, I want to ask you uh, about North Star. What is North Star? Why do you think it's important as we're building a, a psychedelic ecosystem or a visionary plant ecosystem? So North Star comes out of a group of about 100 different uh, deep uh, psychedelic thinkers, theorists, researchers, uh, practitioners who uh, set about thinking really, really carefully about the fundamentals that I, that I talked about earlier. Who are we serving? What are our ultimate goals? How can we bring our actions in alignment with what it is that we're, that we're trying to achieve? And they put together a document, the North Star Pledge, which um, I think is just a beautiful document because for me, it distills all of the essential lessons that I have learned from psychedelics. And, and, and presents them as guideposts as we consider building an industry, as we consider the commodification of, of psychedelics. What are the principles that we need to keep in mind? Because and to a lot of people, to myself including, included, there's, there's a great deal of promise in the idea of legal uh, uh, psychedelics and a legal industry. But there's also a great deal of peril there. And, and you know, one of the unfortunate things that's happened in cannabis is that as we've seen the rise of very heavily capitalized public markets for cannabis, we've seen that, that you know, many of the power positions in the industry have been occupied now, not by people who care about cannabis or really understand it, in some cases even use it themselves, but whose priorities are really more about creating profit and, and accumulating capital and wealth. And I think that we need to be very, very careful about um, allowing profit making to become 
the sole priority um, uh, in the psychedelic world. Uh, one of the lessons I've learned from psychedelics is that uh, intention uh, is probably the most important factor in outcome. And for me, the great promise of psychedelics is, is the creation of a new world, a new kind of human civilization. So let's make sure that, that we keep that ultimate goal in mind, even as we figure out how to move these substances through human civilizations and societies in a way that, that makes sense. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, in terms of a medicinal versus recreational approach for the industry and for regulators, um, if you were to give a, a, a true pathway, would it, what, what would it be in order to get psychedelics into the hands of people who need them most um, through whatever modality and therapy and therapist that would need to happen? What's the fastest way to get there from a regulatory perspective? The fastest way to get there from a regulatory perspective, I think, uh, is to just create a situation where the um, uh, personal possession and um, uh, production and sharing on a nonprofit basis of these visionary plants is allowed and is legal and uh, allow a variety of various different practitioners. Um, they may be licensed social workers, they may be psychologists, they may be indigenous um, uh, psychedelic healers who have been practicing their form of, of, of healing for, for generations and generations. Uh, all of, of, of those options should be open and should be available. We should create the widest possible funnel and the greatest possible opportunity for people to experiment with different ways of using these substances. And you locally in um, Oakland, there's a big decriminalization movement. There is a, a, a small movement, as you said, of, of people who trade in uh, the, the wellness of others. Um, where, where do you see that in the next 24 months going? Well, On Oakland- a hyper local basis. Yeah, Oakland uh, was wonderful. I was I, I had nothing to do with it, but uh, Oakland last year passed a decriminalized nature bill, which made the enforcement of laws against visionary plants the lowest a law enforcement priority in the city of Oakland, essentially legalizing them. Um, uh, the um, the next step now is really to think about how. Uh, can, how psychedelic practitioners can come together in a safe kind of way and build ceremony and, and build community and build therapeutic options for each other. And so now the, the next phase in the movement is really thinking about how to create spaces, not where there's going to be commerce in psychedelics, but safe spaces where people can come together to have psychedelic experiences and ceremonies in a way that's, that's, that's free from any kind of fear of law enforcement interference. And, and so that's the, the, next, the next step. And I think it's really consistent with this spirit of uh, just trying to figure out what we need to do next and, and allowing a, you know, a thousand different flowers to blossom. Well, I think what I've learned is that an open dialogue um, and I've learned from you, an open dialogue and having the conversation and being able to talk in a language that both regulators, scientists, activists, and humans can understand is, is probably the biggest step we as a community can take uh, to have these conversations and not um, sideline anyone because of the business model that they've chosen, uh, but to really embrace uh, this community because we're all part of a movement. We all believe in this for, for the reasons that it's so good in that it can help humanity. Um, and we don't want to get too caught up in ourselves and in our own businesses that we, we forget the larger picture of, of the ecosystem that's being built right around us at the moment. And that's, that's I think, something that, that we can only learn from people who have been doing. How, how long have you been doing cannabis um, activism? Well, I've been doing cannabis activism for you know, about a half a century now, uh, for, for quite some time. And look, it's, it, it is coming together in a spirit of mutual respect and humility. 
understanding that none of us is so clever that we're going to understand after 2000 years of really not thinking very much about these, these plants or these substances, the very best way to use them out of the gate. It's going to take a few generations for us to figure this out. So let's be gentle with each other and, and, and let's support each other. But let's be humble, right? What I would hate to see is a situation where people who have therapeutic psychedelic companies go to regulators and say, oh, you know, don't, you know, we're different. There's those bad psychedelic hippie, spiritual, religious nut practitioners, right? And I would hate to see the people who believe in the spiritual aspects of psychedelics to go, oh no, keep those horrible corporations out. Oh, we can't have them touch psychedelics at all because then millions and millions of people who can benefit from these substances won't have them. It's not one or the other. It's, it's all of us together, each walking the path in, in, in our own way. And the best way for any of us to double check what we're doing is to consult these medicines. Take something, sit under a tree, listen to the bees, listen to the birds, make sure that your actions are in alignment with the, with the spirit and the yearnings of your heart. And, and if we all do that and we trust the medicine, we will get home, all the way home eventually. Well, let's be gentle and let's be humble. Um, thank you, Steve. I, I enjoyed this conversation immensely. I'm constantly inspired by people around me who have delved into these issues and sought pathways, whether they're regulatory or financial, um, to heal the planet and heal people. And thank you for everything you've done in order to do that. Well, thanks for the appreciation and thanks for your good work and amplifying the message. All right. Be gentle and be humble. And be well and be free. And be well and be free. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta give us the. There you go. There we go. Uh,